Great to be here. Um, I'm going to start with a moment when I was working as a carpenter in Cambridge um, after law school and uh, on a, at a settlement house, the Margaret Fuller House. She was a suffragette in the 1800s. And they took her big house, made it into a settlement house. And I was supposed to make a dark room upstairs dating myself and on big beam, big beam work, which is a lot of fun to do. And downstairs at 3 o'clock, all the kids would come, working class, from all over the middle schools, and they would just go nuts playing dodgeball, go crazy, do whatever they wanted to do, and they started to hear noise. Um, and they liked noise, so they started coming upstairs to see what I was doing. And I started showing them what I was doing. And then over time, I started showing them how to use the tools. And then I realized that I was looking forward to 3 o'clock more than doing carpentry downstairs. And that's when it occurred to me uh, to begin my career in education, which has been 39 years. Um, and another thing that happened to me that I think is seminal to just sort of set this off is having, or I then taught under DSEG, I, I taught at McLean's Hospital, at woodworking at Harvard Psychiatric Hospital, and then I taught right when DSEG was starting in Boston, where I was a WM, I was a WMO because I was a white male who lived in Cambridge and I had to change one of the letters. I, I couldn't change the W, I didn't want to change the other, so I moved into Boston. And everybody had a code number, literally, under DSEG. Uh, a one, one every adult and child, one, uh, one was black, two was white, three was white Hispanic, four was white Hispanic, all the way up to eight, which was other. And every time you wrote anything, you put all the codes down. And the point of DSEG from Judge Garrity was to get all these kids who were in different places. Uh, they, were, they were abusing something called home and hospitals under special ed as a way to stay out of DSEG. And so he forced everyone to come into these magnet schools, which had to be named after dead white males, which was sort of a Brahmin notion uh, that, that, um, that, and that everybody else is ethnic except them. Um, and so, uh, so I did that, and I was working with those kids, and that's when I really started to think about our notions of intelligence. And the realization that the more we narrow, and we do narrow, our idea of what is intelligent, by definition, we've broadened our view of what is not intelligent. And similarly, the more we narrow our view of what is motivation, we have broadened our view of what is not motivation. And these kids were motivated. Um, I then actually went to Harvard to work on rewriting, and Adria is here, who I worked with, but a, rewriting the federal vocational education law uh, with Paul Wexstein in 1990, which affects every community college and every high school in the, in the, in the country. And if 2% of the people are taking advantage of what we put in there, that would be a surprise. So I realized that that really wasn't going to work either. And, um, and then became principal of the oldest high school in the United States for a brief period of time. Now, um, Harvard and it were, and, and Boston Common were all, and Boston and Latin were all opened at the same time. Um, and uh, all of the people in all of uh, the Northeast could have fit into Fenway Park when those things were built. So I want to just talk, I, I've been thinking about this. Where did education really come from? I mean, Thousands of years ago, if you wanted to learn something, you sat at the foot of a master, someone, a woman who showed you how to do this, a man who showed you how to do that, whether it was weaving, whether it was making something so that you could do fishing. And that one-on-one -on -one beauty uh, kind of got lost over time. And then we moved into, and of course, Socrates, you know, law school, Socrates, the Socratic method, we use it a lot at my school's High Tech High, 400 BC gave us a way of, of changing the fact pattern and thinking very differently. And then, um, and then what happened was across every continent for a couple of thousand years, males, before continents were possibly crossed, males left their community to go into these redoubts up into the hills and study religious texts. And, and when Rob and I, my colleague of these many years with whom I could not have done anything like I'm talking about, I remember once we were in, in, um, we were in Washington, um, excuse me, we were in, in Milwaukee, and we're trying to get into this big, 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 big school, and there were, all the doors were metal and you couldn't get in them, you know, there was no entrance <laughs> like that, a big urban school, and I thought, you know, we haven't really come that far uh, from those places where schools are sort of isolated from community. So, what I'm going to do is go quickly through High Tech High. High Tech High, so what High Tech High tried to do because of DSEG was the following. What I learned from Boston, what I learned from Cambridge is that housing, surprise, surprise, housing 
segregation is the cause of school segregation. In fact, when we were in St. Louis, uh, we saw that they spent $4.8 billion over from 1968 to 1996 on forced busing, and we know uh, how that did not work, and, and it didn't work in Boston, and it didn't work in Cambridge. What if we had taken that money back then and built well-situated, decent, mixed-income housing? The intervention might have resulted in more integrated schools, but that's basically uh, not, not what happened. So that's why I think actually with Howard um, Fuller, a really good friend of mine, I think we should co-write a piece called Ferguson to Ferguson, because he is a Ferguson guy, Plessy v. Ferguson, separate but equal, 1896. I'm a Brown guy, 1954, together and equal, even though, never, even, even though that didn't happen and even though this didn't happen. So what we did at High Tech High was to use zip codes. There's something called Proposition 209, which forbids the use of race or ethnicity for picking anybody for a public institution. I don't agree with it. It's had a, a very deleterious effect on African-American students getting into the UCs in particular. And so we said, wait a second. You can't use race or ethnicity. A five-digit number, which is a zip code, the good news and the bad news, it predicts socioeconomic status exquisitely and ethnicity as well. And so we use it. So that means that when you come into our schools, we are absolutely reflective of the entire community. It's the eighth largest district in the United States. That's the only way that you could get in. It's completely non-meritocratic. And of course, it's constructivist, and kids are making things and doing things. That's, that's a lot of, of what we find interesting. But, uh, and I'll just a couple of data points for what's worth. 98% of our kids get into four-year colleges. 86% of our kids graduate from four-year colleges. 17% of the kids in the United States major in STEM. 38% uh, of ours do, if that's a good thing to happen. I don't know. The whole idea is to not be mispredicting who can and who can't do what. That is, the, that is the entire sort of premise of what we're doing. So I had put together something that I was not going to really show slides, and then I decided to because everyone else is showing. By the way, Joshua, you want to win in arm wrestling? Take me on later. You're going to have a win. Uh, uh, um, so, so the, the, you know, the all or some, right? Um, in terms of all or some, it's basically, are we doing it for all kids or are we doing it for some kids? We figured out a way to do honors where if uh, Rob is taking honors and I'm not taking honors, I can be in the same room at the same time. AP, you can't do that. AP, non-AP course takers can't do it. So by doing that, I could not take honors and 76% of our kids ultimately move to honors because they're in the same room with a kid who's doing honors and say, I could do this, rather than feeling like they're in the dumb class, okay? So we're sort of structuralists about that. Uh, we're trying to keep it simple. Uh, as uh, Einstein said, it's easy, it's, easy, uh, it's easy to make something complicated. True genius lies in making it complex. We want, as Michelangelo at the end of his life actually said, I am still learning, and so we want adults to be learning. We created a graduate school of education. Uh, what we went through convincing the authorizer that we could have a graduate school of education embedded in K-12 schools is really extraordinary. Uh, and as Ted, Ted Sizer, oh, I'm glad I'm mentioning Ted. Ted said, who was, he was dean at, at Harvard when he was 31, passed away a few years ago at 78, was here at Brown for quite some time. He said that would be like going to medical school and never seeing a body. So uh, the, the other thing about Ted I want to mention since I'm here, because I remember a conversation I had with him once here. He, I said, when did it, when, you know, for me, it was when I was working at the Margaret Fuller House and seeing those kids. When was it for you? He said, I was in the Army at Fort Devens, and we had to shoot ordnance you know, into, into a bullseye. And there was this working class young guy next to me. And it's all math. It's all math getting the trajectory right. And this kid couldn't do the math. And he could drop the ordnance in a bucket every single time. That's when I really started to think, maybe my view of what is intelligence is too narrow. And I really need to broaden it in, on multiple levels. Um, John Dewey, of course, we stand totally on his shoulders, no question about that. Um, Freire as well, who Rob uh, uh, edited his work at Harvard. Uh, then production, the whole idea of producing, not just consuming, but producing, because if you're producing, you're also consuming. Um, if, you're, if you're consuming, you're not necessarily producing. So you basically get both. Heads and hands, MIT, we're talking, mens a manus, that's MIT's motto, tinkering, the beauty of that. I'm gonna hurry up here. Um, storytelling, Socrates. Um, this, this is really funny. You try to find a, you try to do a slide. Try, if you do a Google image, you try to find a slide for the kids, for, for, for kids talking and adults listening. This is the only thing you could find, okay? Uh, 
It's really kind of tough. So that tells us a lot, I think. OK. Um, OK. And then, and then someone who was a mentor to me when I, when I was working at Harvard said, you know, I, I was leaving there when I was working with Adrian. I had three offers to go to three districts in 1980. And he said, you need to, I said, what do I need to do? He said, you need to do it well, obviously. And I think you can do that, but you need to describe it well. I know you can describe it well. You have to think about where it is that you can do it well. For me, it landed up being, surprise, surprise, Southern California, where I never thought I never thought I'd be uncovering the subject. We have kids, our kids have published about 80 books. They've gotten patents. You want them creating uh, new knowledge, just like everybody else here brilliantly is talking about, that you want them to be engaged, because meaning comes from engagement. <laughs> My thing on perplexity, you, you, want, you want them. Perplexity is a, this is, it's positive to be perplexed. You want them to be perplexed. You want them to be wondering. You want them to be inspired. You want to keep, you want to, you have, you want to keep, make the visible, the invisible visible. You want to reveal what's going on. Public exhibitions all the time of student work, repeated uh, uh, presentations of student work. And then this question of the balance of being, having been at the oldest high school in the country, how do you have this balance of stability and churning? Because parents are often, well, I'm really, really worried about what might happen. So, so I think there's an overemphasis on, 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 on this question of stability. And so if you think about how little school, uh, English history, math, and science came from the Committee of Ten in 1896. And those were captains of industry who wanted to know that when their workers went from uh, Cincinnati to, to, uh, to Chicago, that they would have the same set of skills. And so those subjects are taught separate from each other, which is not how we experience them. And every one of us went to schools where we think, of course, how else are you going to do it? English history, math, and science. Well, there's a lot of other ways to do it. So this this is a problem that we have. Um, and of course, there you go, Einstein. So it's not just what you put in, it's what you let in. And as we like to say, hard on the content, soft on the people. Before ending, because I have, I, have, I have these couple of minutes, I want to tell you about this young man. This is a boy, um, he's a two minute video. This was a boy who, um, who never spoke. Now, it's really interesting to all of us who've had students that never talk. And, and then you read something they write, or sometimes you see them and they do talk, and you feel like, where, 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 where were you? Right? So this boy, I can tell you, because he had lost parents um, and was adopted at an early age, uh, put a piece of wood with a knife up on it at the, his adopted home and fell down on the knife from the couch to try to kill himself and survived. And they all had to do a project. This is his project. No one knew he had it in him. And then I'll tell you what he's doing right now. Would you please show that video, please?
California. Um, so, uh, so all of us are better than one of us. We should not be mispredicting who can and who can't do what. But I want to leave you with the thought of my grandmother, who was four foot ten, an immigrant, who was the first female taxi medallion owner in 1937 in New York City. So she literally sat on a phone book when she said, "Larry, there are two kinds of people in this world: those who think there are two kinds of people, and those who don't." Thank you. <laughs>